Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. People who are joining us and still have a lot of people joined. So today we are at the Business and Environment Learning Community presenting a live chat with a few of our alumni who are working in big 10 companies as Google and Microsoft. We have uh, Laura from Google who has been leading a lot of cool projects at Google since a couple of years, if I'm not wrong. Laura, just correct me. I think four years now. And she's five. currently five. So she's currently global sustainability strategies and operations, and she has also been the center sustainability program manager in the past. And Laura's also experienced working in cities, and she was here at the school of Yale School of Environment back in 2012-2014. And we also have Annie Annie with us from Microsoft, who is currently the global energy market specialist at Microsoft. She graduated from YSE in 2018. And Annie will have a lot of cool stuff to share about projects and programs that have been managing, that have been managing she is managing at Microsoft. And moderating today's panel, we have Daniel, who has recently graduated from the U.S. School of Environment from the last cohort, who would call them the FES. Daniel, I would like you to introduce yourself briefly and we'll take it over from there. And we are glad to have all the audience joining us. We'll continue to uh, accept more people as we proceed. And yeah, with that, I welcome you all in Daniel. I'll pass it over to you to take it forward. Thank you. I'm very excited to be moderating this. So thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I, like you said, just graduated from FES, as I knew it, um, YSE now, the Yale School of the Environment. And my focus really was to try and bring together sustainability with tech, which for me meant clean tech broadly, specifically that was renewable energy mostly at uh, FES, but also spend a lot of time doing machine learning, um, AI, remote sensing, and, uh, and also the financial aspects of these. And uh, I will be joining McKinsey in New York uh, in October. And at the moment, just enjoying my long summer and excited for this conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel, uh, for taking it forward. So with, before we move in today, I just had an introductory question that would you know, help us introduce both of our lovely panelists today. And uh, we, before, take, before we move ahead, there was just one question I wanted to ask both of you, Annie and Laura here, which is what were you, what were you focusing on during your time at Yale School of Environment? And what are you currently working on? If you can briefly share light on what you know, your experience has been from Yale to moving on to your respective roles in Google and Microsoft, that would really help us understanding, you know, how where you're coming from and what kind of stuff you're doing at these companies. So can we start with you, Annie? I was at FES. We didn't have a to find yet, but I would have been in the energy learning community. And when I decided to make the move to after four years in energy efficiency consulting. I really sought to work at the nexus of uh, business and the environment through an energy lens. And I realized after running various programs for EPA and doing research for USAID on energy, I wanted to stay in that field, but I really needed to up my vocabulary on economics and finance, because if I wanted to work at that nexus, I needed to be able to speak the language of every side. Um, so when I was at FES, uh, my focus was to take as many finance related courses at the business school as well as any energy economics, policy analysis, uh, energy markets type courses at FES. Okay. The two programs in that way, kind of forging my own um, mini joint degree type of program over the course of two years. And I made sure to fill those more commercial and transactions driven experiential gaps by a summer internship in capital advisory for some solar M&A. And that helped solidify my next move to do um, solar development specifically on the project finance team at General Electric after graduation. And then from there, I moved on to Microsoft where I work daily with utilities around the world um, and talking energy markets almost every day, trying to figure out how we drive uh, commercial execution on behalf of our data centers and the cloud group, which we can talk about later. Um, and I combine the energy coursework with the finance coursework that I took at uh, field management we don't have those conversations internally and externally, um, ultimately negotiating and executing our contracts along with the rest of the 
Thank you, Annie. We're really pleased to have you here. And now we'll have the same question being asked to Laura. What were you uh, most interested in at your time at Yale? And now what is your current role and how does it look like? Sure. Um, so to give a bit, bit of background similarly to Annie, um, I, I had worked in the corporate sustainability space for about six years um, prior to going to grad school. So I was fortunate that early in my career I got um, the opportunity to do an internship in sustainability at a large multinational um, top 10 global design engineering firm. And then I was able to spin that into a full-time role where I was for six years leading operational initiatives as well as doing some strategic sustainability consulting for Stantec, which is a top 10 global design firm. Um, and I chose to go to grad school because I hadn't really formally studied uh, corporate sustainability per se. I had studied envir environmental topics a little bit in my undergrad, but I was really interested in learning more of those core business topic areas like like Annie mentioned, you know, finance, um, business operations, just really anything around um, business education uh, because that is what I had been exposed to in my day to day but hadn't formally learned and I was interested in digging into that a bit more. So I um, went to Yale, I did the, uh, I think the programs and structure have changed a bit since I was there but I did the two year Master of Environmental Management with a concentration in business which I think does doesn't really exist in its the same form anymore. Um, and I was able to take about half of my classes at SOM. So I took about 10 classes at FES, 10 classes at SOM. Um, so in terms of the FES classes, it was a lot of classes that crossed the business environment interface, like industrial ecology and energy um, economics um, and, and courses such as that. And at the business school, um, I, there was a, there was probably far fewer sustainability related classes at the business school back then, but there were a few in topics like sustainable operations and, um, things like global social enterprise. So those were some of the types of classes that I, that I took while in my program. And I'd say that for me, one of the biggest, um, advantages of the, Yale program and one of the reasons why I specifically chose Yale was a lot of the opportunities for um, practical learning experiences. So for example, all of the fantastic client focused consulting project opportunities that um, were embedded into core course content or um, were something that you could do at an extracurricular level. Um, so I think in all in all, I did about seven of those projects. So with classes like Global Social Entrepreneurship at SOM, um, we worked with a social enterprise in the Philippines to help them figure out how to um, uh, deal with some supply chain issues uh, related to producing their fair trade products. And we were able to go to the Philippines on a spring break and um, engage with the organization directly. And that was a really fantastic learning experience. Um, on the FES side, through the industrial ecology course, I was able to participate in a project in Hawaii um, working with the senator on a plan to assess um, the flow of tires onto the island and like the best, figuring out the best um, use case for tires at their end of life on the, in the islands of Hawaii. So there's just two examples. And actually one other one to mention is that was pretty relevant was working on a, like outside of the core courses, there was a lot of sort of case competitions. And so I did a few of those where they were unrelated to a course, but you had an opportunity through CBA or something else to, to do something um, on the side. And so I did a few of those, um, one of them with Chipotle and one of them in a, one of, one of them was an energy competition with the Department of Energy where we were able to actually travel to, to DC um, and, and, um, and we did pretty well there actually. Um, so those experiences for me were some of the best value that I got out of the program because it enabled me to really tackle real-time sustainability issues that various organizations and companies were facing and get hands-on experience working in a group to solve a problem and put together a deliverable that I that you hope has has value for the for the company um, and then on the side while a student I worked for CBA and then I ended up staying on um, post-graduation to work for CBA full-time for a year helping them to build out some of their business and environment next programs um, and then from that, I, I came to Google. Um, I've been at Google for five years. I started out on the data center sustainability team for about two and a half years. And now I'm on our global sustainability strategy and operations team. And I lead our reporting efforts, which includes publishing our annual environmental report and our CDP climate change report and other similar reports, as well as just in general, aligning with stakeholders internally around like messaging and, and how we track and communicate our, our progress and, and targets um, related to sustainability uh, 
yeah, and so I got I got a ton out of the Yale program. Highly, highly recommend it. it. Was a fantastic experience, and so excited to chat with everybody today. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for all the lovely introduction. And now I'm going to pass it over to our moderator for the day, Daniel. Uh, Sages, yours, take it over. And uh, really looking forward to some interesting discussions that's going to share more like on how Google and Microsoft, two of the leading big tech companies, taking lead in mobilizing the global sustainability agenda. Over to you, Daniel. Awesome. Thank you all so much. So before turning back to you, Annie and Laura, let me set a little bit of a context for our conversation in that when we think about sustainability and tech, I see two distinct issues at the macro level. First is corporate sustainability, and this is what most of us will think of immediately. And this is what dominates the discourse questions of energy, emissions, and materials. But there's also a second uh, question that asks whether the core business of a company is sustainable or has a place in a sustainable world. And these are questions that I find much harder to grapple with. For example, whether selling people more things through ads can or should be part of a future that is sustainable or how much services like cloud computing or Google Maps have enabled sustainable solutions for us and how far big tech's responsibility really stretches in all of this. So today my plan is for us to touch on both of these aspects of sustainability in this order. And then uh, we'll of course finish off with a Q and A from our audience. So now that I have given my personal high level view of corporate sustainability and sustainability issues in tech, I would like to turn to our panelists uh, and ask you how your companies define sustainability and how your org structure is built around that and how your personal work fits within that. And as you answer that, I would also be curious for you to point out how your personal definition differs from that of your company, if it does, and how that might have guided your work over the past years, or in fact, even your choice of company. So why don't we start with you, Annie, and then uh, over to you, Laura. Sure. So to set the scene for how we approach sustainability at Microsoft, of which there are so many vectors you can chase down, uh, let me start with where my team sits. So I am in the cloud energy and sustainability team, and we report up to Brian Janis. So if you read that Vox article breaking out our sustainability uh, initiatives and the goals we announced in January, Brian Janis is the one you'll always see listed in those kinds of announcements because he'll provide comment because cloud is such a big piece of the greenhouse gas footprint of Microsoft. And as we expand our scope free emissions accounting and start thinking into that as well, you'll see perhaps our team will be responsible for such a large chunk of that pie. Um, so cloud energy and sustainability is directly responsible for the data centers themselves, which at present, prior to this announcement, the cloud did make up the majority of, of our footprint. And now when you, when you expand to scope three, you're looping in all of the supply chain and business travel and other, other ancillary uh, items. And so for scale, we're going from 4 million tons to scope like one and two, to now an additional 12 million tons, uh, just looking at I think the last year worth of data. So that's a, that's a one to three ratio, right? Um, but my team will continue to play a large role in driving energy strategy as it relates to the onsite diesel generators that we want to swap out, which we'll talk about later. Um, we'll be looking at water consumption at the data center. We have groups that focus on just the regional uh, execution of various strategies, like launching new cloud regions in Europe. That's what I do day to day. But we also have three functional groups that focus on distributed energy and risk, looking at the tools that we find, what is the portfolio level risk, the cost rates, um, looking at how to integrate distributed energy resources to become a more active market participant. Uh, we look at sustainability from a couple different lenses, including environmental justice, um, uh, ecosystem impacts, zero waste. So that's kind of that functional group. Then we have our renewable energy procurement team. And traditionally, it's based on how Microsoft approached its carbon accounting. The renewable energy team that's housed within the cloud energy team uh, is the one that drove a lot of our renewable energy procurement in the young we saw. Um, then there's this other group within Microsoft called, uh, I refer to them as the Corporate Sustainability Folks. They report up to the Gustafa, our Chief Environment Officer, and Brad Smith, 
president. So that group is more strategic looking at the broader corporate portfolio, setting our metrics, um, taking in data from all the different business units across Microsoft. Um, so I see them in some ways as the quarterback here. And then we of course feed up to what they're kind of oh, Microsoft. Okay. Then we feed up to some of the metrics that they're pursuing and the objectives that they set for their company. Um, so in terms of defining sustainability at Microsoft. My own definition has always been more in line with a legal trace principle, which I think a lot of us at FES or YSA are familiar with. Um, I wanted to work for a company that would be responsible for its own impact on the world. And I've heard some folks at Microsoft say, well, we want to make the data center disappear in terms of a global footprint impact, carbon impact perspective. And so the way Microsoft is defining sustainability We've mapped out initiatives uh, supporting four pillars of carbon, water, waste, biodiversity. And since our announcement was in January, we are seeing some follow on announcements now about six, seven months out that support some of these, but we're just getting started. There's so much more to do. Um, and I think the really exciting thing about my role compared to corporate sustainability, our group is very much critical, mostly driven, we're on the ground finding new leads on innovation um, and different kinds of commercial contracts we can find for our data centers that drive additional uh, market integration of nascent technologies. And we can talk more about that later as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Annie. Laura, the same question to you. Sure, uh, so in terms of how we define sustainability. Um, Google's been committed to sustainability since our since our founding. Really, um, we have really strong support for sustainability at the executive level, um, including with with our founders. So that's something that's been built in since the company was founded about 21 years ago. Um, we started a lot of our uh, really big commitments about 14 years ago. So in 2007, we became carbon neutral and we began procuring renewable energy at a large scale in 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 2012. So there's there's a long a long history there. Um, in terms of just getting a, getting a sense of like where I fit and, and how our org structure uh, plays out, um, I, I'm sure I'm sure Microsoft is very similar. And, and in fact, like our two companies, we have a lot of similar infrastructure and, and operations. So I think that our org structures probably have quite a lot of parallels. Um, so at, at Google, we're a highly decentralized matrix. Is it Guanabana? So, sorry. Um, yeah, so at Google, we're a highly decentralized matrix organization. Um, so we, in general, are, are fairly flat and non-hierarchical. So we have many, many different teams across Google working on sustainability embedded into different business units. We feel like this gives each team the ability to really dive deep on the topics specific to that business unit. So um, this would apply to, for example, the operations side where we have sustainability teams embedded in the data center org, in the real estate org, in the supply chain org. Um, on the product side, we have sustainability liaisons in various product uh, teams such as you know, Search or YouTube or um, Maps has quite a large team doing a lot of great work there. And then we also have um, sustainability leads as well in a lot of the support teams like legal, PR, policy, comms, marketing, et cetera. Um, and our team acts as the central hub for sustainability, which coordinates amongst all of those various other teams across the company to align on our strategic direction for sustainability, our long-term targets, and um, uh, like our plan of approach effectively for sustainability at a corporate-wide level. So we do a ton of stakeholder engagement, and we really help with aligning across uh, different organizations to ensure that we have a cohesive approach to how we're um, addressing sustainability. Um, and then in terms of my role specifically, uh, I started out on, on a partner team. So I started out on the data center sustainability team. So for half of my time at Google, I was working specifically on initiatives related to things like energy management um, and um, other programs within our fleet of data centers. One of the programs I led was our ISO 50001 energy management system certification. So I went around and did energy audits at our, at our various data centers. Um, and at that time, we actually didn't have 
a dedicated central team working on global sustainability. We, we had a sort of a grouping of people, myself included, that were taking on that role, but we were based in different functional teams. And then a few years ago, we made the decision to group together um, the people that were sort of working more strategically cross-functionally and cross-functionally together in one um, global sustainability strategy team um, under Kate Brandt, our sustainability officer. And that's when I moved teams. And um, that's that's sort of the structure that we, we have today. Um, and in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, value, values, which I, I believe was something that you asked about as well. Um, I I mean, for me personally, sustainability is a, a, a deep passion and interest for myself. And I, I feel incredibly fortunate to work for a company that um, shares that that value set. And there's really a strong underpinning of, of dedication to sustainability and commitment to sustainability across, across Google. And um, so it makes me really incredibly proud to work for the company that I do. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. I think that'll really help set the context of your answers for the audience. So um, let me now take all of those issues I mentioned in the beginning, in turn, starting uh, with corporate sustainability uh, as an umbrella. And Annie, let me turn to you on this topic of corporate sustainability at the macro level, because like you said, Microsoft um, made a fantastic commitment that was announced not so long ago of going net negative by 2030 and in fact removing all of your historical emissions by 2050 and like you said not only is that scope one and two emissions but in fact you went as far as including scope three emissions which are three times larger if i got that right from your answer so mm -hmm. in what ways did microsoft come around to committing to such radical targets and how, what would your advice be to those of us in the audience and who are all of us are, are ourselves trying to make our companies more sustainable? Um, how did Microsoft manage to get such high level and real commitment behind mm -hmm. these targets? Sure. So there have been a lot of conversations, as you can imagine, in the background <clears throat> for years. You know, we've been carbon neutral since 2012. We're running at about 60% renewable energy today. And we're, we're aiming to be 100% renewable by 2025. And by 2030, we, we've just announced a whole slew of new uh, objectives relating to being carbon negative. But for instance, we're going to commit to uh, zero waste across our facilities and our data centers. We're committing to um, zero diesel at our data centers. And for those of you unfamiliar with the data center industry, backup diesel generators are just the standard design that comes with any data center. And having toured a data center, there are these massive, I would say ugly, but they're, they're not, I would call them a blight on an otherwise awesome space where you can do a lot. You can run pilots with hydrogen fuel cells as we've been doing. We can use this space to do all sorts of cool things to pilot technologies that will advance the commercialization of all sorts of things. Um, but, and then by 2050, we're going to remove every ton of carbon ever emitted since 1975. So that's framing where we've come, right? And this is what we call our moonshot because we don't have a, a roadmap that's detailed enough to tell you for sure today, we're going to do this. We don't know, but now we have to because we put it on the world and we're treating it like our moonshot. And some of the ways we're, we're going to achieve these goals. I, I know we have other questions that you've lined up that that'll help me get into that later. But um, just to even get to the point of January, which is your original question, we, I think we in the cloud energy group have a unique position within the conversation of corporate sustainability and Microsoft because in part our large carbon footprint. And you know, if you think to what corporations care about and how they measure progress outcomes, a lot of it does come back to metrics and indicators, right? We have our objectives and key results that we have to hit. And if we can convince management that this is an OKR that we need to pursue and document and then track, you know, we can make a case for why it should exist. We should make, we can make a case for why we need to hire more people to then get to that outcome. And I think a lot of those conversations have been underway for 
many years now. And one thing that's very important to us and Facebook and everyone, Google, is what we call social license to operate. Our image and our brand is very important to us. And like Laura, I'm very, very proud to be working for a company where the CEO regularly puts climate and sustainability in front when he goes and speaks around the world. And so that tone at the top has been present since you know, Satya stepped up. Um, and kind of building on that momentum, we've been able to leverage other really important key stakeholders internally, like Lucas Joppa, who runs AI for Earth and is the chief environment officer, as well as Brad Smith, who is the head of our corporate and external legislative affairs group. You know, he's basically the face of Microsoft when we go on diplomatic missions. And so these folks are very incentivized to care that Microsoft can continue to operate around the world and to, to improve our storytelling around what our real impact is in a community. Because if we don't take a proactive approach to storytelling, um, and I'm not a marketing or a PR professional, but I do know that if we go unannounced and just start putting in permit applications for diesel generators and you know transmission cables and substations, the community is gonna say that and see just a big energy hog. And that's not what we are and we're so much more than that, but we need to incorporate that into our story. And that's also been an ongoing dialogue uh, in the background of Microsoft, just from a business and capacity delivery perspective. And so in terms of advice, if you can tack on something that you really care deeply about and you think is really important to this business, and you can tie that to an OKR, uh, an objective or key result, um, for instance, capacity delivery. Can you really make the case that you'll continue to deliver capacity in terms of data center servers if you can't guarantee the community will accept you uh, with open arms? And we've seen cases around the world, like I think Apple had a case in Ireland where one disgruntled person uh, killed an entire project and they had to back out of a multi-million or billion investment because there was community opposition. And I'm not saying that corporate sustainability is just a PR gimmick to get to get ourselves more capacity, but they're so closely intertwined. And we we on the inside have always known we have these initiatives underway. Like we've been working on clean fuels for multiple years. We've been testing hydrogen, as you probably saw in the article we posted a couple of weeks ago. We've been looking at hydrogen since 2013. Um, so a lot of these things that we're announcing now aren't new, but they took a lot of time for the folks that are closest to the ground to do their diligence and figure out how we could execute on this such that when the climate was right, the environment was primed for us to then raise our hands and say, actually, we have something that can solve some of our actual OKR tied problems. Uh, I think it was a positive perfect storm of having the right climate, seeing the, the um, Earth Day announcements from across the corporate industries last year and being able to leverage that momentum and say, look, we have the semblance of a plan, but we need executive sponsorship to really drive this home. And I think for those of us who had been here working for a long time, I've only been here for about a year and a half, but I think folks were actually a little taken aback by how aggressive Satya and Amy Hood, our CFO and Brad, were in saying, yes, let's do this and let's go really big. And we were like, oh, we, we were just hoping to get 100% renewable. That would have been you know, really great for us, but no, it's net negative by 2030 and removing everything by 2050. You know, that's, that's a journey, that's decade plus journey. And it took a lot of work by a lot of people, some of whom, as you probably saw in the Vox article, are no longer here, but they laid the groundwork and did, did the not so sexy day-to-day -day work of doing due diligence, talking to finance, talking to engineering, um, figuring out how we take a concept and commercialize it. And that's what I do a lot on day-to-day -to -day too. If we see a nascent technology, carbon removal somewhere in Europe, like how can I contract for that? How can I lend the weight of Microsoft's balance sheet using our otherwise present OPEX budget to, to, to incentivize that project to come into fruition? And uh, you can probably also read a lot online about what Google and Microsoft define as additionality, but that's a big piece of what drives how we put together that roadmap in the background before pitching it to our executive um, leaders. 
Awesome. Sounds oh, like. I, didn't, I forgot to actually answer your other question about what is my advice. Um, I think a lot of it will be dictated by workplace culture and what structures you have in place already. So um, in addition to tying what you want to do with your workplace OKRs, I would say finding an executive sponsor is really important, especially the bigger the company, you know, workplace politics are real. Like I would love to pretend that people just believe in sustainability and will like get behind you and get things done. Um, but that's, that's not the case. And you need people to help you make the case. Uh, of course, grassroots efforts are important. And at Microsoft, we have a worldwide sustainability community. That was a grassroots effort. A couple of folks out of uh, the Redmond office said, we really don't have a place to convene and put together ideas that we can surface and get broader buy-in on. Like for instance, um, switching from uh, disposable tr plastic and plates and things in our, in our, um, in our dining halls that those are all grassroots efforts. And sometimes they're successful in parts of the world and sometimes they're not. But when you align the grassroots with an executive sponsor, I think that's a model in Microsoft that has achieved some level of success. Um, and the other thing I wanted to recommend is one of my colleagues as a co case study, she used to be on the cloud energy and sustainability team, but realizing that we have a community engagement workforce development group, which is in charge of uh, making investments in the community, partnering with communities and figuring out projects that we can both engage on to improve the conditions of that community that we're going to be a partner in long term. She, she recognized that there are no projects with those communities that really focus on sustainability or environmental education. So she created a role for herself and said, look, communities care about these things. It's directly tied to us being able to uh, launch cloud regions here and exist here, coexist here long term with these communities. And I think we should have a position that can specifically target environmental issues in partnership with these communities to come up with projects like we partner with utilities by default because we have to get a power connection to our data centers. So her idea was, well, what if we partner with this utility and then we put solar panels on the roof of the school, it'll be a joint investment with the utility. So there's already a longstanding partnership there because it takes years to set up, you know, a grid connection sometimes. Um, and then let's tie in elements of environmental ed and let's make this uh, more than just Microsoft is building a data center with this utility. It's like we're, we're broadening investments we would have made in the community otherwise, but we're taking a very strong environment bent to it. And so, I mean, to the extent that you can create your own roles in companies, um, tie it to, as I mentioned earlier, your company's objectives, and maybe you'll surprise yourself and find your, find your sponsors. Because I think all of my, all my mentors in my decade long career have, not all, but for the most part have been like middle-aged white men, you know, <laughs> and, and they've been instrumental in guiding me and helping me grow and finding, you know, the cracks in the, in the org structure where I can insert myself and ask for something that I really want. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that's uh, very practical and, and inspiring. I love the social license to operate, but also I'm glad you mentioned the OKRs because that's something that I really wanted to ask Laura about who, as I understand, you think a lot about reporting, you think a lot about metrics. And I know Google is a place where you really have to motivate people to, to come along on a journey with you and get their buy-in. So as the global sustainability strategy, uh, lead. I'm wondering how you, do you make the case for sustainability projects to, be projects to be adopted, Laura? And also, especially when these are sometimes regarded as a cost center, right? Um, rather than an investment that has a positive financial ROI, what metrics do you use? How do you tie it to OKRs, KPIs? What is your strategy? Yeah, thanks. Great question. Um, and Annie already hit on a, a lot of things that definitely resonate with me, you know, just personally in terms of um, being in this space for a while, as well as how things work at Google. And I, I think uh, lots of other companies as well. Like she mentioned finding champions, and that's definitely a key aspect of leading sustainability initiatives, I, I think, at any organization, um, because ultimately uh, sustainability teams are, are pretty small. Like even though we have, we're fortunate in that we have like quite a lot of people working on sustainability at Google compared to the overall org structure and how many people there are and how many teams there are, it's still a pretty small number. Um, and so 
you're always effectively, you know, under resourced and you're you're never really core business. So you need to figure out how to get the people who actually have authority and control budgets and control operations to align with sustainability goals. So a lot of that is really um, looking for champions within different parts of the business and figuring out who are who are going to be the people that can be stakeholders you can work with and leverage um, to help implement sustainability initiatives. So that means figuring out like where do you have aligned incentives, where are people's personal passions that you can tap into, um, and really building a strong network and building strong stakeholder relationships. So at Google, um, we have a cross-functional sustainability network similar to what Annie mentioned. There's sort of various layers of it um, from the sort of informal grassroots level green teams that exist at a lot of our offices that kind of run their own initiatives and sort of do things at a local level and, and organize things like in their spare time um, all the way up to we have a senior level executive sustainability board which is sort of a formal um, body that we use to um, provide input into and approve strategic cross-functional company initiatives on sustainability and then there's various levels in between we have our full-time teams that are working on sustainability. We also have this, this network of what we call our sustainability leads, which consists of people that lead specific sustainability program areas. So like, for example, I lead sustainability reporting, um, but we have um, more than 40 different people that are in these type of lead roles. And some of them are full-time people on a dedicated team where this is their full-time job, but some of them are just really passionate people that have taken it upon themselves to lead a particular initiative in the company and they've done such a great job at it that um, they're basically formally recognized as being the lead for sustainability for a particular thing in Google even if it's not um, their their core job. So that network is something that we, we definitely leverage in terms of developing ideas and um, figuring out what, um, what to focus on uh, across the company. Um, and you mentioned uh, sustainability being viewed as a, as a cost center. I think that can be the case and is frequently the case at, at many companies because the reality is if you're not bringing in revenue, you are a cost center. But I, I wouldn't say that Google thinks of it like that. Like I have not really felt like, like that is the position that I'm in at Google, whereas I have felt that way in other organizations where I've had this role. Um, and again, I think that comes back to like our long-standing commitment to sustainability and how this is really tied in with our, our corporate values. So at, at the most senior levels, there's a strong desire to um, have deep commitments to sustainability, which obviously require investment. And we've had long-standing investments in things like renewable energy and carbon neutrality, which are obviously costly to, to maintain, but they've been part of our um, strategy for, for, so, for so long. Um, and it's just something that we we do and we continue doing. We don't really think of it like a, a cost center. It's more just, you know, something we've committed to doing that we continue to do and will continue to do. Um, and then I guess one other thing to, to sort of note in terms of you'd asked about um, like how projects, how we decide which projects to focus on or what things to target. So, um, I mean, this is complex, I'm sure, in, in any organization, but but for us, for example, we have a five-year sustainability strategy that our sustainability officer, Kate Brandt, um, led development of a few years ago um, in collaboration with our various cross-functional sustainability partner teams across the company. Um, and that contains sort of the high-level vision and goals for what we're hoping to achieve um, over five years in our, in our three strategic sustainability um, pillars. And then kind of coming down from that, like every team has their own set of targets um, and, and, and goals, some of them longer term, some of them shorter term. Just as a rule at Google, every team needs to set annual and quarterly targets. So that's just embedded into the way we do business. So every organization, team, and individual has annual and quarterly targets. So basically our five-year strategy kind of cascades down into like one year um, goals for all the different teams and then that cascades down at like a sub team and, and individual level and that really helps us stay focused on on our key priorities but um, there's also you know some flexibility there and when situations shift like for example COVID obviously has impacted a lot of our sustainability goals in particular around things like office sustainability where we don't have our offices in operation anymore so a lot of those goals are no longer relevant so definitely they do get adjusted as, as needed. 
And and actually, in terms of I guess metrics you'd asked about as well, um, we do publish a number of metrics in our annual environmental report as well as in other disclosures. But I'd say those are really the high level metrics that we feel like makes sense to share publicly. We have so 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 many metrics internally. Like every team and project and initiative will have its own set of KPIs um, to, to evaluate success of that particular um, project. And so that's a, there's a lot more happening internally that would never make it externally and would never even necessarily make it up to a team level or, or a company level. So we, we are obsessed with metrics and data at Google, so we, we have a lot, a lot going on there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Laura, very much. Um, a lot of incredibly valuable learnings in there for, for many of us. So thank you both. I didn't want to cut you short, but I'm going to have to suggest that we keep the answers just a little briefer because I do want to touch on all of these uh, little topics, at least briefly, because I know you both have exciting things to share. So starting um, with emissions. Um, as promised, let's go into each of these categories. So the ultimate goal is, of course, um, with regards to climate change, to reduce emissions. And in fact, we know that to avoid uh, catastrophe, as most of us will certainly feel, we actually need to go net negative and remove more carbon than we emit. And that is um, what you guys are planning to do at Microsoft, Annie. So can you tell us um, briefly how Microsoft is aiming to do that? How are you planning to remove carbon from the atmosphere? Oh, you're on mute. All right, start again. <laughs> I think being on COVID for this long, we'd all have learned. Um, so there are a couple of different work streams in flight. I've already touched on zero diesel by 2030 and zero waste also by 2030. And I think one, case study, I guess I want to highlight is the Climate Innovation Fund that was also announced in January. So we have a $1 billion revolving fund that uh, we need to disperse over the next, I think it's either three or five years. And we had done a pre-assessment looking at different gaps in financing. Like, are, are we supposed to fill a seed stage? Are we supposed to be Series A, Series B? You know, where should we come in with our, our money? Understanding, as our CFO said, this is a drop in the bucket. We need much more than a billion dollars and no one denies that. So what can we do to make the most of what we have here to uh, spur another wave of, you know, you know either development or R&D or uh, commercial contracts being signed, demand. Um, so the Climate Innovation Fund so far, we've, we've decided we want to be an early stage strategic investor. And uh, in the last six months, you've probably seen at least two announcements come out. One is $50 million investment in Energy Impact Partners, which is a global platform. They have portfolio companies in the US and in Europe, which I'm very excited about since I cover Europe. Um, but we'll be leveraging the portfolio companies there to see what are they developing? How can we uh, reach back into Microsoft and use the different you know, AI groups, the Internet of Things groups, the Azure, uh, folks that, that are working on all sorts of engineering solutions, as well as our project management program development <clears throat> teams that have a lot of experience turning an idea into a transactable uh, thing, right? So we're really excited about being able to use the Climate Innovation Fund to uh, create additional waves of opportunities, not just for us, but for the economy at large around the world. And the second investment we've made is with closed loop partners, where we want to reduce waste at our data centers, which for folks unfamiliar with the data center industry, servers turn over every couple of years. They're not a long lasting thing, right? So every time you turn them over, there's data bearing devices that need to be traditionally just crushed. And uh, you, you take what you can from it to harvest, but the recyclability rates are not fantastic, I would say. So to be able to create recycling facilities specifically for servers, and to use AI to sort through those kinds of products uh, is, is a big step towards getting us to zero waste by 2030. And then a couple other minor work, not minor work streams, but work streams that are still, you know, harder to show any progress on today, but that are in flight are 
policy engagement. So for instance, my team is really concerned with how markets are structured. Are they providing the right market signals that uh, incentivize, say, battery investments on our site? Like we have little batteries, but if we were to put in place a larger battery, we need a market signal to say, if you participate in this grid, you will be compensated to justify this investment. And we're not looking for like massive returns, right? We just need to you know, break even at least. Um, so that's some of our policy engagement just on energy markets. And there's so many other areas in terms of how do we measure sustainability? Is the annual true up really the best model to measure your renewables procurement? We don't think so. Um, and then lastly, scope three, it's such a big piece of what we need to tackle here. And we want to take um, our own internal principles for how we uh, choose suppliers, um, incite uh, responsible behavior internally to our suppliers and our supply chain. So we've also just announced that we're putting in place reporting mechanisms, not just on you know, the emissions, but also social governance. Like how, how are you structuring your organization to protect or incentivize additional hiring of people of color and things like that. So we're taking what's internal and projecting it, throwing our weight across our supply chain to meet those emissions objectives, but also align with the other sustainability related goals. Fantastic. And I'd actually like to continue from here to our second topic, which is just what you mentioned, Annie, um, with regards to energy, thinking about rather than annual true up, how do we think about this on a more granular level, uh, what we or what many of us will probably think of as truly 100% renewable. So Laura, Google has actually been carbon neutral since well over a decade, since 2007. So I'd be curious how you've been pushing the envelope on emissions since and I know that uh, you have a similar initiative uh, called 24-7 um, Renewable Energy, and I'd love uh, for you to speak to that a little as well. Sure, no problem. So, so as you mentioned, uh, we have been carbon neutral at Google since 2007, and we achieved that through a three-pronged strategy. So effectively, the first stage is um, rigorous uh, attention to energy efficiency. We make sure that we're constantly um, investing and in making our data centers as efficient as possible. Um, our data centers are twice as efficient as an average enterprise data center, so we've really um, made a lot of inroads in that over the past decade. Um, secondly, we, um, even though our data centers are incredibly efficient, we're st we still use a lot of energy. As, as you know, Annie mentioned, uh, data centers are large energy consumers. Um, so we ensure that when we are procuring energy as much as possible, we're procuring renewable energy. So we began investing in renewable energy pretty heavily in 2012, and we set a target to reach 100% renewable energy, which we achieved in 2017 for the first time, and we have achieved for the last three consecutive years. So essentially, we match 100% of the electricity use of our operations with procurement of renewable energy. And this is energy that comes from um, new solar and wind projects that are brought onto the grid due to Google's investment. So to date, we've, um, we've uh, um, entered into more than 50, I think about 55 now, um, power purchase agreements um, for wind and solar projects around the world, and that um, totals about 5.5 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity. Um, so then thirdly, uh, there's still, after that, there's still a, a, bit of, um, a bit of emissions that we need to offset um, because that renewable energy only matches the emissions from our electricity use. Um, but there's other types of energy that we use as well, like Annie mentioned, you know, we have generator use at, at our data centers and, and there's other fuel types that we, we utilize, as, that we use as well. Um, so for that remaining amount of energy, that's where our carbon offset program comes into play. So we procure high quality carbon offsets um, that are heavily vetted to ensure additionality, similarly with our renewable energy projects. And then that ultimately brings us down to carbon neutrality on an annual basis. So that's our approach to date. Um, that's how we've achieved carbon neutrality and we're, we're incredibly proud of, of that uh, achievement. Um, but now we're looking at what's next. Um, and that's where we've outlined our vision for 24 by seven um, renewable energy. So how, how I just explained how we achieve renewable, how we achieve carbon neutrality, that um, gets us to carbon neutrality kind of on an annual basis. But in terms of how we're procuring renewable energy, um, we're not actually powering our data center facilities with energy from like wind, wind and solar. Like uh, data centers use an incredible amount of energy. Um, it's um, very centralized and it's not feasible to power a data center with solar and wind um, because solar and wind are intermittent energy sources, whereas data centers use energy consistently. 
Um, so in order to truly get to 24 by 7 energy, it, it involves a lot more um, uh, engagement with the grid to make grids cleaner around the world, as well as looking to things like backup storage um, capacity, as Annie mentioned, like large-scale battery storage and other technological solutions. So our goal for 24 by 7 energy is to ensure that we eventually get to a point where on an hourly basis we're matching our electricity use with renewable energy in every grid where we operate. And that's that's the vision and that's what we're working towards and we're really excited about, about that. Thank you, Laura. Let me turn right back to you on uh, on this topic of data centers. And Annie mentioned earlier that the lifetime of the components of data centers is actually not that long and recyclability is also limited. And this speaks to the third topic I wanted to talk about today, which is materials. Um, and that is clearly just as important from a sustainability point of view, um, even if less so maybe from a climate change point of view. And while we often think of as tech companies, as uh, providers of virtual goods, of course, behind the scenes that involves a lot of data centers with uh, water cooling, servers, hard drives that need to be replaced, and increasingly consumer goods and, and large office spaces uh, with, with famously good food. So, um, Laura, how is Google thinking about their material flows and the circular economy, another concept that is certainly dear to many of us in the audience? Sure, um, great question. Materials use is definitely another critical aspect of sustainability. Um, so we, we are really dedicated to, uh, to working towards a circular economy. Um, we're a global partner of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and um, in addition to all of our work around climate and energy, we've also had a longstanding commitment to reducing materials use across our organization. Um, most notably, this has taken place in our data centers. As Annie mentioned, you know, server turnover is is a large source of a material waste stream for companies like Google and, and Microsoft that um, operate a lot of a lot of data centers. So if you if you think about it this way, we have you know about 15 large scale data centers around the, the world. These are huge facilities just filled with computers that are operating 24 by 7 to bring everyone the products and services that that they love to use um, from Google. And um, those millions of servers that we have, they just like any computer, they only last a few years, and so they will. Um, no longer be be functional for our needs within a few years, um, and there's also uh, components within them that that might break. So effectively, we end up with large amounts of potential electronic waste that would be a waste stream if we weren't addressing it. Um, so so what we've done at Google is we've developed a, a circular economy approach to how we think about um, server lifecycle management. So we, we effectively have like a four-stage process where first, um, when we have servers that, that um, may not be functioning as, as intended anymore, we first look to see if we, can, um, if we can repair them. So if something's wrong with a server, first step is, can we repair it? Um, if not, we look at whether or not it can be refurbished, so combined with components from other servers and whether we can sort of bring it back to life or um, change its use. If it's, using, if it's being used for something that is a uh, high intense computing use, we can shift it to a lower intense computing use and we might still be able to utilize those server components. Thirdly, if that's not an option, um, then we look for opportunities to resell into the secondary marketplace. So we will wipe clean our servers and server components and we'll sell them into the marketplace and they can be used by other organizations um, for other purposes. And then lastly, if none of those are options, then we look to responsibly recycle those servers. So that's essentially the, the circular economy cycle for how we approach um, server management. And then uh, we, we do have some other examples around how we're approaching food waste in our offices, um, but I know we're running short on time, so I will skip that. And if anyone has a question about that later, happy to answer that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, let me just say, we're, we are clearly running out of time. There's always more interesting questions to ask the panelists than there's time for. So we're skipping a few questions, but um, if you allow me, I'll, I'll have two more to our panel, one on environmental justice and, and one on uh, changing behavior um, of people to be more sustainable. I think those are two very exciting questions and, and very pertinent to our times. And our panelists have kindly agreed to stick around for 10 minutes longer so that we can hold the Q&A. So if you guys can, can stay, then please do. Otherwise, all of this is recorded if, if you have a meeting starting at whatever the full hour is for you. So. Let me now touch on the fourth and last topic under the umbrella of corporate sustainability, 
that is thankfully increasingly considered um, within that space, but certainly far from enough, namely environmental justice. And just two weeks ago, and some of you might have seen this on Microsoft's blog, they announced a new innovative partnership with Sol Systems, a renewable developer and investor that combines, and I quote here, 500 megawatts of renewable energy with investments in communities disproportionately affected by envi environmental challenges, including working with local leaders and prioritizing minority and women-owned businesses. So this sounds like a really fantastic initiative, something that we'd love to see more of, and is of course very much in the spirit of our times and certainly our YSE community. So Annie, can you tell us a little bit more about this innovative project and how it came about and what these environmental justice aspects mean in practice? Sure. So we recently hired a new head of renewables, Adrian Anderson, uh, who Laura probably knows. And he really hit the ground running here and he originated this project around the start of the year. And so for those of you familiar with how solar and wind development uh, life cycles typically play out, you'll know that six, seven months is a very, very accelerated schedule to be able to put something together and get it contracted. So I think you can think about this project in the same way I described uh, some of the spillover effects uh, of how we're gonna approach our supply chain. So we, we want to site the projects in places that are underserved and we want to hire uh, workforces, if not train them, uh, to also serve those projects and create these positive spillover benefits in the communities that we're going to site the projects. And that's, I think, the crux of what we're working on with Soul Systems. Um, and then that's in addition to the $50 million uh, investment that we're both bringing to the table to make other community development, community engagement type of investments to improve the, the quality of the conditions in those places that we choose to site the projects. We have a white paper forthcoming, I think in the next month or so. Um, as it pertains to my work in Europe though, environmental justice isn't necessarily called that there. And you'll see a lot of, uh, Daniel, you probably know this since you live in Europe, but um, the European Commission has put out their plans for what they're calling just transition. And so you see this crop up in different forms as you look across the EU and how different member states transpose those ambitions. So in Spain, for instance, just transition to them looks like an equitable transition from coal to potentially renewables because Spain has a massive solar potential and so and very little storage. So there's there's a lot of ways that each member state will transpose that but incorporate those elements of environmental justice and Microsoft's goal as we continue to move across Europe and deepen our investments and engagements in those communities, we want to piggyback off of the ambition set at the regional and national levels. Great, thank you so much. I'm very excited to read this white paper. Um, we will probably let our community know once it's out in case you wanna read more on this. So lastly, before opening up to audience questions, I wanna move on from corporate sustainability to what I call big takes place in a sustainable future. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning of this panel that I wanted to touch upon at least one of these questions that are a lot harder for me to grapple with. So let me make the following claim. Big tech companies like Google and Facebook make the majority of the revenue from ads and ads definitely have the ability to influence people's behavior. At the same time, big tech also has the biggest reach in the world in the sense of having a direct connection to more people than probably any other country or organization on the globe. And big tech has our time and attention. Um, and they do so at very critical moments when we make decisions on purchasing goods or transport decisions like when we are using Google Maps. And so that really makes me wonder why the likes of Amazon, Google and Facebook are not necessarily using this enormous power to influence our behavior to be more sustainably. And most of us probably would agree that uh, behavior change is one of the critical components of becoming more sustainable, but it's also the hardest. And so why is, say, Google or Facebook not displaying the environmental put footprint of every product and service uh, in the corner of their ads? Or what if Google Maps showed the footprint of all the different options between cycling to public transport um, and even give us a choice of um, take, choosing routes based on CO2 emissions rather than time, right? 
they would be educating us in the process, enabling more sustainable decisions, and even nudging us to be better if they made the environmental or the sustainable choices the defaults. And so this is my last question here to you, Laura. Do you have a sense where this kind of thinking fits within your company and why, at least from the outside in, it hasn't taken hold yet? Yes, I, it's, it's a great question. We, we are um, a, a company that has nine products with more than a billion monthly active users. So we have an incredible platform to be able to share information and we consider there to be a great responsibility with that. Um, our mission ultimately is to make the world's information accessible and useful. Um, and we, we have done a number of things which do help people to take sustainable actions in their day-to-day -day life. For example, we integrated transit um, and cycling and, and walking directions into maps um, in partnership with transit organizations around the world. Um, over the past year, we've also in integrated um, electric vehicle charging stations into maps. Um, and through, through um, initiatives like that, we're helping to get that information to people who are interested in, in, in um, reducing their emissions from commuting or just you know, taking transit or, or cycling for, for whatever reason um, they might wish to do so. Um, and we have a number of other examples, like for example, in our Google Shopping um, product, we have integrated use of filters. So if, for example, you're searching for a health and beauty product, you can um, search to see if it's organic or fair trade, and you can bring up products that only meet those um, those criteria. Um, and uh, and I can think of a number of other examples across our products. But one thing I'll just say in terms of um, Google as a platform is that we we are meant to be a core source of information for you know billions of people around the world, and because of that, there there is an expectation that we do maintain some amount of neutrality. So um, while it, it sounds like a great idea to actively push out information to incentivize people to take environmental actions, not everybody wants to see that or would be receptive to receiving that information. And first and foremost, we, we have to um, align with our core business objectives, which is to be uh, an objective and, and somewhat neutral platform for information for the world. So we always need to be very cautious in terms of what information we do present or we don't present. And there's um, this uh, this um, dis discussion of kind of like active versus passive. If somebody is actively searching for something, then we can be more proactive in, in getting them information around certain topics. But if there's no indication that someone might be interested in a topic, if you push information about that, people don't necessarily um, respond to that very well. So that's that's one reason why uh, we, that that's just one example of like a, a constraint where um, we're not necessarily able to implement all these fantastic ideas that you have. And, and I will say that all of these ideas you mentioned, we have thought about this and there's so many more ideas that we think about often and we're, we're on this journey where we are continuing to discuss and think about how can we use our billion plus user um, platforms to um, help encourage people um, to make more sustainable decisions. And one last thing I'll just mention is that we did partner with the California Academy of Sciences um, a few years ago to build a platform that does just that. So we have a platform called Your Plan Your Planet, um, which uh, walks people through day-to-day -day activities that they can choose to, to do to reduce their environmental footprint. So that's one example of, of where we have leaned into that. Amazing. I love it. Thanks for, for that inspiring end note. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let us turn to the audience questions now then. I see I, two questions that are sort of tied together. Um, so, so let me kind of try and join them up a little bit. The idea, the question here is what kind of roles at big tech companies like Google and Microsoft are directly focused on sustainability and what specific skill sets are required to work in these positions? And um, there was one question that asked similarly about the skill set, but a little bit more specifically coming from a student who is an MBA with no necessary, not having necessarily a previous background in sustainability and would be great if you guys could touch upon um, what, how they could position themselves as a pure MBA for a position like that. I think it might be hard to jump straight into a sustainability role, at least looking at the ones at Microsoft without having environmental experience. But where I've seen success is if, say, you start in supply chain, you can leverage things like the sustainability fund to pitch pilot projects and start to bolster your portfolio that way. 
I think the beauty of our announcements in January is it challenges every org to have a plan. And so if you want to be on that V team, the virtual team that tackles that objective from your team's perspective, I think that offers a bridge into that community. And a lot of the community is relationships driven. We find a lot of our hires from our broader network and it's a little bit incestuous in that way, but also <laughs> you could be part of that network too, if you wanted to be. Awesome, thanks, Annie. Laura, would you like to comment a little bit on the broader skill set that, that you find valuable in this and the types of roles that focus on sustainability? Sure, I'd, I'd say that um, I think it depends on the org structure of the company and how the roles are distributed. So at a smaller um, company or a company that has a smaller sustainability team, I think being a generalist with a lot of um, experience in different sustainability topics is, is highly valued. Um, at a company like Google, because we have so many people working on sustainability embedded into um, different business functions, they have highly specialized roles. So if someone is working in, for example, a responsible supply chain or renewable energy procurement, they have deep, long-standing expertise in that area, typically with you know five to 10 years of experience working in that space prior to, um, to jumping into that role at Google. Um, but then I will also say that in, in general, in the sustainability space, I think that because it's such a cross-functional interdisciplinary field, um, there's almost no background that isn't relevant in some way to a role in sustainability. Um, so I have met professionals that have literally every background you could possibly imagine during my career. And at Google, we probably have someone working on sustainability that has literally every background you can possibly imagine. and you know, we do have a number of sort of career sustainability professionals that this has been what they've worked in most of their career, but we do also have a number of people that shift into a sustainability role from a non-sustainability role. And um, like I think any any kind of um, hinted at this, I, that is most common, I think, when someone has deep expertise in the functional nature of the role. Like for example, on our responsible supply chain team, someone who's worked on the supply chain team for 10 years, and has an interest in sustainability could much more easily shift into a sustainability focused role because they already have that deep knowledge in the supply chain. Um, and similarly, I've seen that that happen across many different roles. Amazing, thank you, Laura. And then we had a question here on courses recommended that you took while at YSC or FES for you guys. Any, um, whilst you were speaking, quickly typed up some recommendations uh, for our audience in the chat if you guys want to see it. So. Um, Laura, same question to you. What were some of the courses you'd highly recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not necessarily the course itself, but it's what you make of the course because there's a lot of, when you think of grad school courses, I think that the reality is um, you can't probably read every single thing and dive deeply into every assignment and then also, you know, have a social life and do all the extracurricular stuff and, and hold down a job that, that you need to do. So you need to figure out where to focus. So um, even if you were, regardless of the specific courses that you were taking, I think there's a lot of opportunity even within courses to decide how to focus. Like if you have to write a paper or you have to do a group project or you have to um, you know, build a client-focused consulting project or select one, what are you picking from within that set? So having um, a sense of the type of skills that you think are gaps in your skill set that you would like to develop or gaps in your knowledge area that you would like to develop and focusing on developing those in grad school, I think is um, is something that I would recommend. Thank you. I, I would say saying no to things was my secret for success. I really put on the blinders and I was like, I am only taking these courses. I'm not doing that many clinics unless I have a very strong need to fill a gap in my resume with this clinic experience. So I really said no to a lot of things that help keep me focused because I think I have a little bit of ADD. Good advice. Yeah, it's like a candy store. Um, all right, um, we have one more question here from Helena or Annie, and let me read this out because it's a little bit longer. So Helena is saying, Annie, you mentioned that Microsoft is starting to do policy engagement in energy markets. Can you talk more about how Microsoft approaches policy engagement? For example, the Ceres letter to Dominion, is there a team member that is actively tracing rapidly changing energy policies and utility announcements going to 100%? And are you and your team working with other companies 
or think tanks to drive regulatory and utility, utility action to meet your CNI needs for clean energy procurement? Yes, to all of that. Um, so apologies if I framed it as we're just starting to do this, but we, we have been engaged on the policy front for a long time. And in fact, we partner with Google too, and we want to tackle a policy issue or regulatory challenge together, which I've seen us um, join multiple calls together just to figure out how tactically we're going to we're going to present our message and what we need out of this engagement. Um, so for instance, if you look at, I think it's our Cheyenne, Wyoming project, uh, we definitely engaged the regulator to create a new tariff because we didn't want our presence to trigger a brand new natural gas power plant. We thought that was overkill for what we were doing. So instead we agreed, look, we have some onsite generators. You just make sure you can communicate to us when you need us to tap those. And then we'll, we'll take ourselves momentarily off the grid as needed. Um, so if you compensate us for that with a different tariff or a rate class, that, that meets kind of both our needs. Cause we don't want to, um, going back to leave no trace, we don't want to negatively impact the communities we're on just because we're there by increasing their rates. That's very counter to how we approach our energy strategy around the world, um, America's or EMEA or APAC. Um, so in terms of how we tackle this on a day-to-day -day basis, our head of policy sits within the EMEA group, but she does have a global reach. Um, and I believe she's also building out a team. So those of you who are policy oriented, I think in the next year or two, you'll see maybe another position or two come down the pike there. Um, but she has worked with folks like Reba and, you know, we're on the uh, RE100 group as well. And we have a lot of partners across the industry that help us track and consolidate comments on different, uh, uh, different policies that are coming through. And we also do, you know, the really boring job of tracking FERC dockets and figuring out what's happening in PJM and how does that impact our ability to interconnect or pursue different renewable energy outcomes or sustainability driven outcomes. Um, how does that change what kinds of investments we make on distributed energy on our site or off our site? So we do have policy tracking frameworks in place across the world, and we continue to iterate on that to see where do we need more coverage um, as we're growing, growing our cloud portfolio. Awesome. Thank you, Annie and Laura, so much for your uh, incisive and inspiring answers. I think uh, we'll leave it at that for Q&A, um, seeing that we're a little over. And uh, I'd like to thank you both um, for, for participating in this panel. It was a really exciting discussion. And I'll hand it over to Kevin Doyle, our director of our career development office, to close it off with a few remarks. Yes, and I'll be very, very brief. Uh, this is Kevin Doyle from the career development uh, office. And um, both of you, thank you so much for bringing so much wisdom and thought and you know, content to, to this audience. I'm so glad it's recorded for those people who will, you know, want to, want to listen and, and think afterwards. I just want to say to, to all of the students who might uh, be on the line now and who might listen to this afterwards, um, we're here to help you craft strategies to use your two years at, um, at YSE in exactly the way that Laura was suggesting. Every paper you write, every capstone you do, every class project, every client initiative project, uh, your independent studies, et cetera, they can all be crafted to have mutual advantage for both uh, academic learning and career development, and not to put too fine a point on it, uh, deep networking with your community of practice. So come to us, we're here to help you craft those strategies and make sure that when you graduate, you'll be the next to be hired uh, at Microsoft and Google. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, Laura and Danny for helping us understand so many different aspects about how, these com how your companies are tackling sustainability challenges. And it was a thrilling uh, conversation. I am really, ex I was really excited to have this webinar today. And I think the purpose has been really fulfilled. And I thank you once again, and hopefully we'll have more uh, engagements with you all in future. And for the audiences out there, as Kevin already mentioned, and a lot of us who have already been here for a year or so, the community offers you so many opportunities and so, so a lot of programs out there that help you curate these kind of career paths. And hopefully we'll all be able to make some sort of impact down the line sort of companies that we will work. 
And with that note, I would just close off the session and wish you all a good day, good evening, or good night, wherever, whichever part of the world you are in. And keep uh, having these kind of conversations, keep taking the inspiration forward, and let's make, a be let's make a better world and let's keep doing good for the environment. With that, I'm signing off. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Pipple, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yo.